Good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, I'm Sean Lardo from OIT VoIP. I have on the on the line here again today with me Chris Weiser from Seven Figure MSP, also up, an awesome buddy? dancer. Also an awesome doing? dancer. I'm great, thank you. Um, How do you, know? you don't even know that about me. You don't know that. <laughs> I've watched some videos. I saw you on okay, Dancing with the Stars. Um, also, we have with us one of his uh, one of his clients, a good friend of his, also uh, Paul. Paul is RV, an MSP from okay, doing great. Sorry, I'm totally just talking through everything. Uh, Paul is an MSP owner from Vital Integrators and uh, is, as I mentioned, is a client of, of Chris's, um, has had great success. So the point for this conversation, for this session is about building a creative and effective sales process. That's mm -hmm. what this is all about, which is if anybody's ever seen Chris on everything on social media, because he's everywhere, I see always he talks about, yeah, having a lot of leads is great, but if you don't have a really good sales process, it's irrelevant. Um, so that's what he's about. Paul's going to test to this. We should have a great time for the next hour. We do want everybody to be engaged. He's here to answer questions. We're all here to help. So first, let's start off with um, Chris. Let's talk more about the program and you and how this even originated, because I knew you were an MSP. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So thanks for having me. First of all, any presentation I can do in a t-shirt, I'm a happy man. I'll tell you that we're, we're all so used to being on stages and doing all this stuff and it's like wearing suits and ties. And I love presenting in t-shirts in my home office. So I can't really <laughs> argue with it. Um, I do miss the travel thing though. It's kind of, um, last time I traveled, I got COVID. So <laughs> I'm, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it is what that's it is. not best. Well, you know, yeah. my, my Marriott points have dropped tremendously Me too. Although they I, just gave I, us that big bonus. I don't know if you saw that, that they, they gave out, they gave all yep. the flat numbers. And yeah. Thank God. Titanium a bonus. So that was cool. So anyway, um, uh, as you mentioned in, in your open, I was an MSP for 10 plus years mm -hmm. and, um, I was up in the Milwaukee, market. Uh, it was in my actual home city was Waukesha, Wisconsin, a little suburb of, Mil of Milwaukee. And I started out as a one man show, you know, so I was a, actually a retail computer shop and cell phone store back in 2000 and had three singular stores, sold that off, grew it, kind of realized that B2B IT was the place to go. But then was obviously running into some challenges as I started to grow the business. And it's many of the same challenges. It's, it's kind of interesting because if, if I go back to when I started my MSP in 2004, I look at the exact same challenges I had then are almost the same challenges that MSPs are having now, except for realistically, the marketplace is much more difficult to sell into because all of your clients are in this place where they've pretty much already seen an IT vendor or an MSP in some capacity, right? So they're, yep. they're already known, knowing kind of what to do in the mindset of what to do. But the challenge is they've had this, and I talk about reframing the client mind a lot. They're in this world where they think they have all the answers. They think they know how to support their business the right way. They also think they know what they should be charged. And that's sure. the biggest challenge we have. And what the biggest, what the MSPs and, and note that the way that MSPs that we deal with that are coming into our program out of the box, the, the way that they're selling is the same way I sold in 2005 when I just came into the business. That has not changed. It's been this like static thing that everybody's sure. selling and it's still like we see and we take, you know, between um, my, my sales team and I do a really good job. We have a a great head of sales named Lisa Compton. Lisa's been around, uh, I think our, oh, we, like, yeah, everybody knows Lisa here. We all know it, Lisa. <laughs> yep, yep, we all know Lisa. She, she's been around this event like crazy. But one of the things that we see is, you know, we talk to 100 to 150 MSPs every single month, new ones, and they're still selling exactly the same way with the same price mindset. And sure. we're going to talk a little bit today about how important it is to have a sales process. Yes. But the thing that we're selling now, which is really, really a differentiator. And that's part of why Paul's here because Paul came to me. I still remember our conversation. <laughs> Paul and I were our initial conversation. He signed up with us. And I think what Paul, 24 hours in, you were like yelling, like we were in a yelling yeah. match. Yeah, we were like, <laughs> you're like texting each other. Like, you're dumb. You're dumb. You're dumb. You're dumb. And, it was, and I'm like, dude, we got to get on the phone because you're not like, you're, you're missing some stuff here. And it kind of built this relationship now. Um, so actually, Sean, do you mind if I like transition into Paul a little bit or do you have a couple other questions? Cause I just want to no. like bring him on a little actually, bit. Actually, I have, I have one question about what something you said. Um, you said about training the, the training, the customers. Do reframing you find yourself, the mind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you're reframing them, but you're also, I'm assuming reframing the MSP as well at this point too. 
Well, you know, so part of it is the MSP has to learn a completely different way of selling. Sure. The, the biggest problem, like, the issue that we see right now is MSPs are traditionally technical people, right? Almost yes. everybody that started an MSP, very few are MSPs that were started by a salesperson or a marketer. They're usually started by somebody that was good at tech or good at computers or whatever, and then decided, I'm going to grow a business and I'm going to scale it. Sure. So what happens is the tech sells based on the things that they're comfortable with and the things that are low hanging fruit for them, which is usually techie stuff. And yes. what's really important in your mind, if we want to talk about one thing that an MSP can reframe your brain on is sell to the problem you solve, stop selling products, sell a solution. Sure. And you know, we've all kind of heard this uh, there's a bunch of little acronyms about selling monthly, which is your MRR and mm -hmm. all in seat price. Well, I actually have eliminated all that. I mean, obviously we still talk about MRR, but we've eliminated the all in seat price mindset and we still calculate some things by seat, but we call it, Paul, what do we call it? All in solution price, right? Yep. So it's, it's solve. What problems does the client have? Right. Our presentation and our proposal and our assessment review and everything that we do with you is going to be about solving those problems. I don't care what's in that. We're going to solve the problem. So it's a solution that we're selling and it's a single line item. Absolutely. So, right. So, and as we reframe the client, the client brain, um, we have to trick, we have to trick is the wrong word. That's absolutely the wrong word. That's not what I meant to say. We have to transition them from thinking about widgets, us supporting those widgets. And if you think about my, my initial open was talking about, we're still selling the same way that we did in 2005. What right. did we support in 2005? PCs, servers, backup, BDR kind of exi didn't exist back then, but it was, you know, we're still selling all those same things and we're selling the support of those things. When now, what things, what do hackers do want? Do hackers care about walking in your building and stealing a computer? No. What do they want? They want data. Right. But nobody's sales process has transitioned into the risk of data and mitigating that risk. So we'll talk about that a little bit more today. Um, and, and does that answer your question? That's a lot. Yeah. Like I, I talk well, a lot. So I hadn't noticed. Um, so let's Chatty talk about cat. Paul then. <laughs> well, we might as well get Paul involved now. Let's transition over to Paul. Paul, I believe that Chris has some really kind words to say about you, obviously. Sometimes. Other than the fact that you really fight. <laughs> But other than that, uh, so yeah, by all means, let's kick in the ball. No, but I, I want to just say that real quick too. Um, for me, that was something that was important to see him demonstrate how to deal with someone with objection. <laughs> um, sure. And he, he modeled what he teaches, you know, um, and it's such a different mentality and different, you know, shift in, in how we're actually delivering our sales process now. Um, and it was important on the front end to, to see that and have him stick to his guns on, on following the process that he had. Um, it was great sure. to, to see somebody actually do that. So did you, did yeah, you find it to be like effective? Like, and did it save you time for one and for two, did it help you increase your sale average check or how did it, what, where did it benefit you? Uh, the whole program, because <laughs> it was, it's been a lot. <laughs> Um, yes, you know, and, and I think that's one of the things it's easy to get into the mindset of, um, thinking that you've got things mostly figured out as a business owner. Um, I mean, we had been, I, I would say mildly successful, um, in what we, we had done in the last couple of years. Um, but not knowing, um, how messed up our process was <laughs> until someone from the outside came in and looked at the process. Um, right. And hey, Sean, can that. I say something on that really quick here? Um, you know, Absolutely. one of the things that I will say around that is Paul wasn't doing a bad job, but he was very comfortable in what he was doing and he was really focused on selling those widgets and mm -hmm. not even so much selling the widgets, but he was focused on selling the support on those widgets sure. instead of selling the support on the risk. And one of the things that we do in my program, and it's not just the sales process. No, the sales process is critical. I'm not going to debate that. Sure. That just gives you structure and it gives you something to fall back on when you get out of whack really is what it is. What it mm -hmm. on. But what's critical is that we're focusing on instead of selling support on things and selling backup, like those are all things we are sure. selling 
the risk mitigation of risk. In fact, Paul, you are no longer an MSP in your own mind. I believe you are a cybersecurity and risk expert, uh, risk mitigation. Mitigator, yep. <laughs> right? So look at how different that is from we're a managed service provider. Sure. So you're seeing the future. You're prepping them for, yeah, I mean, because we, I mean, we saw there was a hack just recently with Carmen and, and when, when, when that happens, there's 10 million, what was it? $10 million from mm -hmm. Carmen that happened. Oh, and, Carmen. Yeah, and yeah. That's, yeah. that's a legitimate issue. And that's a, and I remember when it happened with target way back yonder and everybody went up in arms. Right. And it's so funny. You use that. I use that all the time. Cause I was, it's interesting. Cause when I had my MSP, I was in Milwaukee. I was the guy that the news stations called because I was already doing PR and press and marketing all this stuff. And I was on, you know, Fox News in Milwaukee mm -hmm. and, ABC and NBC. I was on all those stations and we were talking. So I still talk about that target hack all the time. Absolutely. Realizing, do you know, does, and you guys that are watching this call, the MSPs, at least for sure, that are watching this know where that came from. It came from a temperature control, small HVAC. vendor, an, an HVAC vendor. Exactly. Yep. And that had a phishing email that they clicked on and that opened up the floodgates to massive profitability for the hacker. So it's been a really good case point. And the real important thing is making sure that through your sales process, you are actually, and so many MSPs, and I'm going to tell you 95% of MSPs that come into our sales discussions as we're trying to talk to them about our program are not doing assessments of any type. They're sure. walking in the door and saying, Okay, here's my stuff. Well, you're you're literally becoming a commodity at that point. Yep. Right. You're, yes, you're, absolutely. So this this entire industry, if you are not making a assessment and a consultative sales process out of it, you have com completely commoditized yourself. And if you don't understand what a commodity is, how are commodities purchased? How do people decide? It's all based on one low common denominator, which is price. Absolutely. Right. Yep. So, so do you find that, okay, so you're saying, and, and uh, this will, for lack of a better um, comparison, you pay for car insurance, right? Nobody ever asks what's in the car insurance, but you know, when you buy a car, you have to get car insurance. Mm -hmm. it's, I it's use a, hurricane insurance as the example all the time, especially perfect. in your business, you, right? Business liability insurance. Yeah, because you already know you need something because something may happen because now you're mitigating. Now you're taking away from the aspect of if something should go wrong. And that's the same aspect that you're talking about here. And it's a completely different thing. And if, and again, those of you that are MSPs that are watching this, that have been on the sales floor, Paul, I'd like to hear what your response is. I've never asked you this. How many times did you ever hear the comment? What's the, who's that guy with the cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> He's right down that there. Guy. There is. Um, but Paul, how many times did you hear as you're sitting at the table? Okay. What's tell me what the ROI is on your support services. Like we've all heard that discussion, right? Well, and it's funny you bring that up. <laughs> the, literally this morning, um, we had a client. We went in there. We did our whole process. We, we followed the sales process. Um, and that's the first thing they start doing. Uh, it's been a month since I've heard from them, and they're starting to try to go back and that. well, what can we take out? What can we do? And when we, it literally took us about an hour to have this conversation before we made any headway um, to get the customer to understand. But it was – their question was – Oh, well, if we're spending this much money that they're already spending, then they're assuming people are already taking care of all the cybersecurity stuff. And it's like, yeah, that's the assumption. Just because you haven't been paying for it doesn't mean that this is kind of where the industry's at right now. Um, and so it was kind of an education side for them. And now they're going back to the drawing board and going to see like what ha what have we been paying for? <laughs> Yeah. And I think you bring up a really good point there that <clears throat> a lot of these people are really concerned about the widgets. And, you know, when I talk about widgets, it's all the stuff that they have to support and they're, uh, they're missing the whole point. Lisa brought up in the chat earlier. I have this analogy I used about the cookie jar and for years, uh, Sean, I'm not sure. I saw you not. I don't know if you've heard her t talk about this. Not that part. No. I did a webinar with Ignite a couple of weeks ago. And I kind of came up with this on the fly, but for so many, and I actually just happened to have a cookie jar. I was at my friend's house and I had a cookie jar sitting next to me. And for years we were carrying around this cookie jar as MSPs thinking about all that mattered was the cookie jar itself, which are your computers, your PCs, your, your network itself and firewalls and all these things. When we didn't realize we were carrying around this cookie jar and inside of it was solid gold cookies this whole time. And we didn't even know. And the hackers figured it out before us. We all kind of said that when they learned how to spell, we'd be in trouble. And we've always said that for years, right? 
Um, but now we, we know that there's all these solid gold cookies in the cookie jar, but the clients haven't realized this yet. That's the mm -hmm. stuff that really, really matters in the data. So you have to show to the, to the client. And I know we're kind of getting off track a little bit of our sales yeah. process discussion, but all this stuff is so relevant because this is, this is the key is making sure the client understands that the infrastructure really doesn't matter that much. Yes, we have to support it to keep you functional, but the stuff that really matters and really costs money, the things we have to mitigate that risk on is that data. And we have to, how much risk client are you willing to take? We just, and Absolutely. every pack benefits us, right? So that's where, well, that's the message that we try and get across. And that's the difference that takes you from that. And, and Paul, do you mind saying really quick, you might not know this off the top of your head, but before you started working with us, where you were at like a per seat cost and or a number that you were charging versus where you're at now? Ballpark? Yes. Ballpark. So I didn't really do a per seat cost and how we would come up with it. Honestly, I would kind of get a number in, of, of employees, number of computers we had to manage, and we would basically do blocks of hours. Um, we weren't doing a, you know, all in price. Um, but even that was a, just an absolute guess. <laughs> um, it was literally like throwing a dart at a dartboard, and yeah, hopefully. Yeah. But do you know it. what you were charging? At, um, on, like we averaged that. What were you like? So we, we were roughly pitch. sixty-five dollars an hour. Okay, so, is, so so what came what comes into us now, Sean? Just so you know this, the average seat price that we see, and what I ask people when they come into a consult call, Lisa asked them this as well. How much MRR do you have? How many seats are under agreement with that? And we just yep. divide it out. The average coming into us is about 63 bucks per seat is what they're actually that's, And That's about right. And honestly, that's a good way to explain it. We would figure about an hour per computer Okay, is, is what we would do. And that was about $65 an hour. So that's how I would normally price something. Now, the, the difference is we'd put a cap on that and then you pay overages. Um, but it was definitely not in our our best interest at all. <laughs> well, I think the other thing with that is it definitely gets confusing. Oh, hundred uh, percent. Yeah. And what's the, and what's the, and what's the, and then so that, you said the average is $63 per seat. You would see with the MSPs where to, if they learn the process and, and what you said is very relevant about educating them on why they build a process and how to build it around it. Where, what's, what's the target dollar amount then? Uh, Paul, where do you sit now? Do you mind saying like your average? No, so we're, we shoot for anywhere from 250 to 300. Um, is where we would, we prefer to be. Um, okay. Now, some legacy clients, you know, that's that kind of is a, a sure. different <laughs> different animal there. But um, yeah, that's, ar that's an argument. <laughs> new clients, we 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 are we're shooting for that range and uh, and, and getting it. So yeah, and I think you know our goal is to start at two fifty, and honestly, then this is per seat per month. So if you have a ten user network, we're going to be looking for twenty five hundred dollars right out of it, and that's the minimum that we charge and. I guarantee you every MSP is sitting there and like, I can't do that in my market. I can't do that in my market. Paul said the same thing to me. Um, yeah, <laughs> right? sure did. And what I promise you is if you are working on following the sales process, which we're going to talk about in a little bit here, I got some slides we're going to go over. If you've put a sales process in place, you take the technical discussions and move them to the side, right, Paul? Yep. Um, you stop talking tech start talking about solving problems and showing them how much actual risk they have. Understand, we just talked about hurricane insurance. They are seeing zero ROI on hurricane insurance, on general <laughs> liability insurance, like all these things that they budget for, but they're right. seeing zero MRI for this, or MRI, uh, ROI for this stuff. <laughs> right. No, so, but, it, but, it's, but it's based off a need though. It's based off an unforeseeable cost that could happen in the future. And that's, and you're basing off of, Hey, this is what you could possibly lose if this should happen. So you're, and that's the mitigation. Can I, can I, can I say something on, on yeah. the, on the process and why this is, this is key. And I'm going to use this same client as an example today. Um, so instead of trying to go and give them a price for labor and this is what we need to do. This is our price per hour, which is what they were asking for. The, it, it changes the value of, of our delivery, okay? Because they should have been HIPAA compliant uh, and, and they're not. And so we have a solution for that. And we're, so I, we were able to explain to them, hey, we're looking at your whole thing, how we can partner with you, how this is gonna solve the solution to make you compliant, make all these things in place where we don't have to be 
<clears throat> nickel and diming over what, what is important and what's not. We look at your business process. We look at what you have. This is the solution you need. Um, and that's, that's the challenge, uh, which is, right. is, is makes us more valuable and does separate us from other people in the industry that are just trying to give a price. Now, don't think, Sean, for one second that it does not take a mindset shift of your of your own. No, we talked sure. about this before, earlier. Like, <laughs> it is a like the battle that Paul and I got in initially was Paul's like, this isn't going to work. This is not going to work. Right. Like, and he, I still, I, I probably still have the text on my phone. I should go back and I should go back and frame those. <laughs> you, you should post it on it social was, media. With his, I would post it on social media <laughs> with his original per seat cost he charged, and then I would do it. I would do Paul now, you know, and, and it, hopefully you have like a really good big purchase you bought because of this or something, like a really nice car or something, you know. <laughs> stand in front of that with your new average seat cost, and then I would just basically put like eat it to everybody so they all understood because that's the mindset. I totally agree. Well, and, and this is a, re- a, I can't tell you how difficult it is on our side to fight through those mental challenges, like the head trash and the stuff that we work with on a regular basis. Paul, I got to tell you, you've been pretty easy from that standpoint. Like we, we had an initial breakthrough that we had to do. And then he's been like, okay, I, and, and I think you had an initial deal that you were selling that first week. Mm-hmm. And this goes back like the first week of January in 20, 2020. Um, and once he saw, like, he didn't win that first deal, but nope. then the client like got breached, like literally that. So you had like kind of like a gift horse kicked you in the mouth right there <laughs> <clears throat> and the client got breached or something. I forget exactly what happened, but then they came back to you. I think you ended up not even signing them if I remember right. But yeah, we, we didn't sign them. The, you, the other one you're talking about was an existing client who, who we had done a presentation for uh, on the cybersecurity side, doing the whole education piece. And they were like, no, it's too expensive. And then like the next week, um, I think the CEO or the CFO clicked on a link and was like, oh, well, maybe we do need to revisit this. <laughs> um, but it was great because it was something that we had already alerted them about um, because of the process. And, yeah. and following the process is the biggest takeaway I can tell you from from being in the program. Oh. So I want to answer one of these questions really quick. Keith Nelson, Nelson just had one in the chat. I'm, gl- I'm glad you said that. I was going to bring it up to you which too. Which is a great discuss. Which is a great question. Um, so Keith just said, "I'm confused. Selling solutions would have a value not tied to seat count that has a value set on deliverables." There's, you're thinking of of solutions in a different way. I said a solution, which is all of their problems bundled into one thing. That's what you sell. Now, how do we calculate price internally or that we're going to charge? Yes, we still use seat count because that still is a variable, but it's also language that the MSP knows that you guys can relate to because every MSP is coming into us. That's part of the reason that we do that is, is the discussion point is, oh, well, I get this much per seat. I have to be able to relate this back to MSPs somehow. Okay. Because we got a long road to go down mm-hmm. to make sure that you're comfortable with it. So we have to get into something that you can quantify. We know that I can ask, you know, almost every MSP is selling per C right now. But if we just say, okay, we're going to sell it for 2,300 a month, they're going to say for what? Like, so that a lot of that comes into the play. Sure. Um, and can I jump in on one thing though? Mm-hmm. So with, uh, we, you know, I sit on with Dan's group, everything MSP, and we were talking to a bunch of MSPs one time, just some weeks back. And the conversation came into play about per seat or per device. And there was like a, we had several saying opposites. So what is, where's the, it sounds from what you're saying, the better business model was per seat almost per user well, I mean, per everything. And, and it's also, you know, so there's how many other variables are in, in the mix besides the seat number of seats they have. There's a lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, so you have to look at, this is why we kind of started our baseline calculator is like 250 per seat, but you know, let's say we're going to, but then we got to look at the risk also. We get how much risk does a, 30 user CPA firm have over a 30 user, I don't know, general contractor that doesn't have a whole lot of personal data on it. Well, what does the CPA firm hold in its, in its grasp? They have credit card numbers, social security numbers, driver's license, sure. they have literally all this personal data. So you have to factor that in. Then you also have to look at, okay, does every single, does every company have a trail traveling salesman? Like there's all these different variables that you have to calculate in. My, my thoughts are you calculate internally per seat or get a little bit to a little bit in the weeds on this, but it's a mm. good question. Use 250 a seat as a baseline. Our goal bottom line is look at what your cost is to support the environment. 
look for an 80% sure. margin is what, it, I, what I, it was where I go for an 80% margin is what we're looking at. Where honestly, most MSPs are at about a 20% margin before they even add themselves. That's, that's amazing. That would, I guess that's where you get your 60 to 63 to 250. That's the difference, so, right? For, for instance, too, and, and all, every customer has got a little different scenario, right? Um, for the most part, where our stack stays the same. Now, in the, in the case where we were going to add in uh, HIPAA compliancy, um, let's just say for the sake of argument, that would be a $500 a month cost for us. Well, if that's a 10 user person, I would just increase that cost across the seat price to $300 instead of 250. But your seat price is, even though it's not a, a cost per person necessarily for the HIPAA compliancy piece, you're still internally figuring that price out um, on our yeah, end. There's a lot of, and there's a lot of variables that come into this. Like uh, I see in the, in the chat here, we got Brian and Keith talking about some different things. My point is in looking at a baseline traditional deal, it'd be that. Sure. But if you're looking at, and Keith just brought up, okay, we have a dispatch system has 60 seats, blah, 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 et cetera. I mean, look at, look at what does it take to get them to the place you need to support them, which includes, all the things that should include liability, like we talk about cybersecurity first and all these other things out of the box. The traditional sure. MFT, what are they talking about? They're talking about managing PCs, servers, help desk support, maybe some engineering and backup. That's what they're talking about. But now if you're going to be an MSP, like we haven't even gotten into this yet, Paul. If you're going to be an MSP, it's implied. I had a really long mm -hmm. webinar with Danny Jenkins from ThreatLocker a couple of weeks ago, and he came onto this webinar and said, it is now implied that an MSP is an MSSP, whether you think you are or not. And right. he That's has happened spot twice on. to me this week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is. So bottom line is you have to be providing, and Brian Lichtig, this goes to your question, what are you giving them for that price? You have, as an IT guy, I guarantee you all know this. You walk into a client. If I was to had an unlimited budget and I was to say, I need to protect you from hacking and all these other variables and, and mitigate your risk the best I can, but also support all your stuff. If I had an unlimited budget, what would I do? That's what you should be doing. And that's your solution. That's what should happen. But so many MSPs, what they do is they allow the client, think about selling back to 2005. They allow the client to dictate how they, or the market, maybe the client or the market to dictate how they support that. Well, the market says that I should include these things or the client says, I only want seven things in my stack. Okay. I'll do that. But what happens if you're taking on liability at that point? Like there's a lot of variables that go into this. My point is that we put a process on behind it. Sure. We really add structure. We really add focus. You know, we can, we can talk about all these different things to get into the, the, weeds of it sure um, no right we, you know, so we can yeah, the, 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 the price it sounds like it comes down to that. go ahead paul go ahead i mean the price per seat isn't that's just an internal thing for us but the process of following to to, to make us be the ones that are actually dictating the process and not the customer because the customer could always come back and say if they're griping about price my answer this morning was okay well not everyone's a fit for us because i can't in good conscience, tell them, well, let's cut these things out. You don't really need those. Sure. You know, um, because it's, I, I've looked at their whole thing and I've done my assessment. We know what the, we know what their solution is and we know all the things that they need to have. So it makes the whole conversation a completely different animal. Paul's also in this place now where he, it's okay for him to say no. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, most, again, most MSPs are coming up to us and saying, I've never said no. Like I'll take any client I can get because they're so desperate for revenue and they're so desperate for some sort of MRR. And it sounds like this all sounds kind of bad, but it's all true, especially when you know we're talking to a hundred plus MSPs a month and we just do patterns. You know, when you see that many people, everybody says yes. And when you say yes to everybody, to everything, you're gonna put yourself in harm's way without question. Absolutely. Well, I see it as being a business, you become the business partner, right? You actually come in, you become the business partner. And when that happens, that, ter that turns you into the trusted advisor. It's the same as if I had an internal IT firm, they were my staff, and I hired you as a CTO. You would tell me, this is what's messed up. We got to get ready for this. This is going to happen. We better prepare. We have this renewal happening. We have these threats that could possibly be. We need to get our people squared up. That's right. what typically happens, right? Absolutely. And if you think about how many times a client has said to you, I think that's too expensive. Let's take some things out. What do you do? 
If the answer is, okay, let me, like, you should not. I have this thing that I say, do not sacrifice your stack, period. Right. As a professional, you think about any, if you went to your CPA and said, hey, I only want to pay this, I, I want to cut corners on all this, what do they do? Uh, no. They don't sacrifice. They don't say, I only want to no. pay half my fee to you, so I would like you to only do you know part of my taxes and I'll just wing the rest. I tried that. It didn't work at all. It worked out <laughs> failed miserably. Uh, the government doesn't care about that either. They don't hear about it. So yeah, no, that, and that makes sense. So, so bringing it back around to a process itself. So Paul, you may, you mentioned three times in that one stint about the process. So it seems like, okay, so the re-education of you to understand what the value you bring, which actually contributes to the total cost you're going to charge. Right. But the only way we can do this by the business relationship, turn into the trusted advisor. So mm -hmm. tell me about the process. How, how hard was it to change and what did you do? <laughs> so we had so many things, like I said, that were that needed to be corrected, and and having something that that was a proven track record, and, and it started with me. I mean, basically, it, I was probably the biggest hurdle in the whole deal. Um, but also having it, uh, the freedom that it allows us to standardize some things allows us to scale at a much faster rate. So we're able to take on more clients because. The training process of our technicians are easier because they're only having to do these things. This is what we have to make sure that we're, that we're the experts at, right? Um, and so implementing the process, I would say, was was probably slower than Chris. I know it was slower than Chris would have liked because he, he's, <laughs> he wants us to be as successful as possible, as quick as possible. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the mindset, he talks about this a lot, you know, the mindset of a technical person like I am um, a lot of times is you want to get everything in place and you want it all fixed and you want to know how it works and you want to know all the details of the stack before figuring out the, the process. Um, sure. And, and you can get so bogged down into the the details of all of that stuff that it doesn't really matter. You know, one of the things Chris's um, program is, you know, you say this, hey, we're we're uh, software agnostic, right? And it's the same thing. It doesn't matter what programs you're using to do these things if the process is correct. Yeah, there's uh, we see so much paralysis by analysis. It's crazy. Um, I had a guy that I was talking to this morning, actually. It's a guy that I've known for a year, literally two years I've known this guy. And we had a conversation about being in my coaching a year ago. Um, and he was commenting in my Facebook group yesterday about how he uh, doesn't have his operations in order. And then we got on the, we got on a call this morning. We were talking, and his operations actually are fine. He's just terrified of moving forward. And then it comes out to find out that he's got actually – all month to month agreements with every single client. And it's like a ticking time bomb to, and then he's tells me he wants to exit in like three years. And I'm like, you're not going to do that. If you have month to month clients, I mean, you can do that, but you're not going to exit very well. If you don't have any agreement, like there's all these different variables that come in that you have to make sure. And a lot of times the head trash, like we talked about earlier, gets in the way. So, sure. So let's, let's flip this over a little bit too. So let's talk about QBRs and stuff like that. If you don't mind, mm -hmm. just curious. I know you guys offer that and I know that you guys work with, well, you, I know you work with your, with your MSPs on it, on the evaluation of it and working through it. So does that also build into your process? Does it also add a separate line of process maybe because of it or how does a that, how does that work? It's, it's actually very similar. And you know, one of the things that we have are, are when a client comes into us brand new, the most important thing we do out of the box is have them go back to their existing clients first to try and move them yep. almost. And I'm going to say 95% of MSPs are not doing quarterly business reviews or technology business reviews of any capacity. It's we kind of crazy to me. <laughs> what, what was that Paul? I said we weren't. Yeah. <laughs> most are not doing any type of QBR at all. And if they're doing a QBR, who's running it? It's usually a tech. A sure. QBR should not be something that is done by engineering because it just becomes a ticket review period. Sure. Um, stakeholders. And, and it, I understand you have data you want to give them and that's important. That's great. Like we work with, we work with one of the sponsors here, Lifecycle Insights, and those guys give a tremendous amount of data, but it's data that the stakeholders and the decision makers care about. That's so you have to make your QBR about that. We, yep. we start that process or even start that process by we actually have taken the term QBR out of the mix and we call it a cybersecurity review. 
So we start the process with a cyber security. Then they actually magically all care about cybersecurity reviews because it's kind of a buzzword <laughs> now. It's right. a good thing to hear about. Um, and we start down that process and we come into the to the cybersecurity review saying, we actually, we're going to sit down and review all your cyber. We have new things that we need to talk about the markets. I mean, we can always talk about that, right? It's, I mean, the market's changing constantly, but we're establishing a couple things. We're first of all, sure. internally doing a full risk assessment for our clients that involves looking at all the risk points, not worrying about the technical stuff so much, because we already know what that is. And we're already controlling that. We care about the risk points, the things that we've not touched upon. Um, mm -hmm. We have discussions with them that are strategic in nature. We touch on those points and we say, here's all your risk. How do you want to manage that risk? And then <clears throat> go through that. And that's kind of how we breach into that existing client sales potential and sure. upping, upping the revenue and also potentially signing a new agreement. So that guy that I was just talking about, that's, that's got all the month to month contracts. Our deal, first of all, would be let's go in and, and do a cybersecurity review session, do a full risk analysis, and let's put a kind of a lot, let's put a stake in the ground, line in the sand, sure. you want to call it and say, here's kind of where we sit. Uh, you thought for years that we were managing and we talked about this earlier, every client that you talk to is going to think that you're already doing cybersecurity yeah. for them. Whether you think you are or not, they all think that. And it's now implied and there's precedent. Did you want to say something? I agree with everything you're saying because I've actually heard it several times over. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it becomes to where, and I saw Lee say before about the, it's the all you can eat basic package. And I think the problem that a lot of MSPs have is they define what the all you can eat means. Um, they, they don't know what they're covering. And, and it goes back to something you said, they assume you're an MSSP now anyway. So well, just, if you didn't just, know you were, you're not doing it. Yeah. And you know, MSP and MSSP are terms that we use, but the clients, like they bundle all this stuff together. They don't, they even like, they think MSPs do websites and all this other stuff too. Yes. They bundle. But, so go ahead, Paul. One, one of my customers uh, last week, we were having this conversation where we sent them our MSA that we were making them sign and all that stuff. And they come back to us with this list of questions. Oh, well, we thought y'all were doing this already. Well, y'all have been backing up our server. You're not backing up our email. If their email's Office 365. No, it has nothing to do with the backup of your server. They don't know the technical side of that. Um, so it's very important to have, the, like to go and educate them. Like that's the whole point of what the QBR is more of an education piece for us, not of, hey, let's talk about this person that needs a new computer. It's, it's so, a much so broader conversation. Let, let's dive into that for one second. Something that just stands out, you said, you have to explain, they don't know what, what it really means technology-wise. Right. So is it, so it's your job to speak in layman's terms almost, be the mm -hmm. translator, right? And tell me why it's a problem and what the future effect is going to be in English to me, right? Well, it should so, be the why. You, yes. What you just said there is it should always be not the what or the how you're doing it. No sure. stakeholder gives a crap about that stuff. They sure know why you're doing whatever and the end deliverables and is it protecting them and giving them money. But more importantly, now you should be discussing, here's how much actual risk you have and here's what we're doing about that. And here's, here's how much liability you're going to be stuck with. Cause these guys do not know this. You think about all of the ransomware attacks or the breach attacks or the phishing, you know, all these different attacks that are cybersecurity related, almost every one of them is a reactive nature by the MSP at that point. Almost all of them are. I, you know, I work with sure. a bunch of different cybersecurity vendors. They are dealing with this stuff all the time. And sure. the tech guys that are watching some of this, they're sitting there saying, oh, not in my house. Okay, that, fine. That's, that's great to hear. But even like Garmin just had a $10 million ransom. Like, okay, yep. so they have more money than you. Like, my points are there's holes in your house, all this stuff's there, but you have to make sure that that liability is discussed. All those yep. different things. Are well, right? I mean, hell, Equifax had it happen two years ago or three years ago, they got breached for a decent amount and disrupted their data. So nobody's impervious to this. And I actually, I saw Keith, Keith, you're such a great contributor, man. And Keith constantly stirs up the pot, just so you understand. That's, oh, he's very good at it. Yes. Know. And he's very knowledgeable. The problem is he's very knowledgeable too. So if you're going to get into a battle, he'll start digging up all kinds of analytics. So, but all his points are, are re really well pointed. I, I'm glad you are Keith. So he said about, I would like to focus not on QBR, uh, never use them. It seems that there's, it's stale data. So if you shift cyber review, then aren't you discussing holes in your stack? Issues you'll be addressing daily. Um, I don't know. I think the QBR kind of without, I think when you think of a QBR and assessment, I think that's when you're looking for new business and working with your existing clients. And I think that's maybe it's a good 
topic when you think about people that shift from break fix to being MSP as well. I would imagine I they. Care, that's like, well, Keith also just said, I think it should be an ongoing conversation. I absolutely agree. I'm never going to debate that. Yep. But here's the problem with that, Keith. That's your world. Look at the 99.9% .9 of other MSPs that are out there. And I'm telling you this as a guy that talks to like between Lisa Compton, that's in this group talking and me, we talk to over a hundred MSPs every single month. I'm not necessarily talking about you, Keith. If you believe your house is in order and it's perfect, that's fine. But again, 99.9% .9 of MSPs that are out there have massive holes in their stack and their client thinks they're supporting it. That's and the challenge, right? The, so going back to what I was saying about education. So the other thing is I make it, especially with our existing clients that had the understanding that, or they thought we were doing X, Y, and Z <clears throat> to, to, to go back to them and say, Hey, I'm not going to go show them all these reports of things that we're doing, but what I am going to show them are the things that we prevented um, and the things that we're able to stop. So where, you know, some of the tools we use will say, hey, these things were investigated. This number of logins on Office 365 were stopped. Multi-factor authentication. We're showing them an actual tangible safeguard that they're able to see. Sure. That before, it's like, okay, all this stuff was happening before but we didn't know about it. Now we know about it and we're able to, to, to stop it. Um, so it comes back to the process. Back to education in the process, yeah. So it comes back to the process. And Keith, to your point, the ongoing conversation, that is a process you already have built in. That's a discipline that a lot of people don't necessarily have. So the way I see QBRs being is if you structure yourself around, you do a QBR and we'll say quarterly, hopefully everybody does it quarterly, at least it requires the MSP to actually look and do an evaluation and then in, in return educates the customer and one of two things occur either you find you you probably find the holes in your stack like you said and now you have an upsell opportunity so now there's well, a sales process the stack is always changing i mean the stack can change yep. every year every every six months um but it also takes the conversation away from things that are an emergency that we have to fix to hey we're being proactive how can we move forward how can we replace these things or upgrade it, it changes the whole sales process into actually selling to needs of the business, not trying to just fix and plug those holes yeah, um, and being reactive. It's more I proactive. Think, you know, Alex just brought up a scenario here that is more and more happening now. We have to be in what, what having scheduled meetings and documentation and agenda does. First of all, it makes you very structured and very professional. Um, my team structured meetings. When I had my MSP, we had very set structured QBR meetings. We did not, we did not miss a single QBR with any clients in over 24, my last 24 months before there, we didn't miss a single one, but we're also moving into this place of CYOA. And if you guys don't know what that means, <laughs> it's a very technical term. Uh, I love <laughs> acronyms. And you added a letter to it. It was just CYA. Well, I yeah. was in the it was in the chat. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> Alex said it in the Alex said it in the chat. It's CYA. Well, he, but he he's always long winded. You have to have some type of liability protection. We're getting into that stuff now. So hey, um, do we want to hit my slide deck or yes? Gonna, we actually no. <laughs> hey, I know. I know. <laughs> We're gonna keep going to the evening event as well. No, um, actually, Chris does have a a deck that he actually presents, um. If you want, do you want to pull it up or I can't, doesn't yeah, matter. I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up for you guys here really quick. Um, so the, you know, the bottom line on this and I just kind of, let me just make sure it's actually sharing. There we go. Okay, cool. Yep. I just want to kind of go through the, the baselines of things. And I'll tell you what, if you guys want to book a call with us, um, totally willing, you know, like Lisa's in here, we have a room that's in here as well. I'll talk about this stuff all day. We just only have an hour here. So we got to be uh, obviously, absolutely, at least deliver what we said we were going to come to deliver. Uh, Paul and I and Sean could talk all day on this. So some yes. of the most important things, you know, <clears throat> I saw discussions about different tools in the chat and all these different things. Make sure that as you're working with now, some of this is new clients, but one of the reasons I re recommend and suggest that you start with existing clients first is to make sure that you can test your process and get stable with it. One of the things that we do out of the box when we work with a brand new client, we want to help them get a sale really quickly and get get ROI on our product really quickly. So we go back to existing clients. What we've found is over 90% are out of contract. Over 90% haven't been talked to in a sales capacity. And sales is kind of a bad word, but sales should be a good thing. This is an actual business discussion versus always a technical one. Paul was talking about, you know, how often do you talk to clients if you're not meeting with them with a business discussion? It's all, it's always emergency crap. Like that's what you're talking about. 
So make sure that you have a dedicated sales process. That's multiple steps. You look at any sales coach, sales trainer, any of these people that are out there, you want to have multiple touches, multiple steps. But if you're building a sales process from scratch, start with your existing clients first and make sure that you're also doing discovery on them. If you don't, you know, if you feel like you're comfortable with your technical side of things, look at the risk side. There's massive holes. I think there was a question earlier about what, give me an example of a hole in, in the stack. I mean, if, if you don't have multiple different threat vectors, you know, I'll give you an, my PC right now is running Huntress and threat locker and <laughs> rocket cyber. And like, I have all these different and Sentinel one. Like I think I have four or five different tools. There's no one tool anymore. So the amount of MSPs that come into us saying, Oh, I only, I, I got a, I got web root. Okay. You got one solution. Like there's no one protection anymore. So make sure that you're careful on that. Make sure you have multiple touches, make sure. And it's honestly, it's okay to walk into your client and say, uh, yeah, times have changed. COVID's a great example for that and a great reason for this because we're in a scenario now where, okay, hacking's up 200% during COVID. We need to have a conversation. Okay. That's standard. almost nobody says no to that, really. I mean, Paul, has anybody said no to you on, on that yeah. discussion? Nope. And I mean, it's been, you know, going back to those and having those discussions about the times have changed because it's that, that was one of the things that was a struggle for me. It was like, well, I don't want to go to all these clients and basically tell them, Hey, here's everything that we haven't been doing for you. So it was really more of a, hey, we're going to educate you as we've been educated. And, and, and as our industry has changed, we're going to explain that to you how it has changed. Yeah. And I think somebody mentioned earlier in the chat that, you know, this, the stack is, I, I, I think it was Dan mentioned that the stack is changing daily. Like the yes. stack is changing constantly. We're not in a place now where you have three years on the same tools. You barely have three weeks on the same tools now, right? So go there, have those discussions with them. With new clients, make it a minimum of three steps in that discussion process. You should have an introductory discussion meeting. You should schedule an assessment for a future date. Have a actual assessment that should include, yes, technical discovery but it should also include risk as part of that discovery, looking at all those things, how much data do they have, those golden cookies that we were talking about, and then actually schedule a presentation. Do not email your proposal, actually present it to them live. Like all these things should happen. This is a real sales process, right? Right. On your initial discovery meeting, on your initial, and, and there's kind of difference between sales discovery and technical discovery, but your initial meeting with them, you see what number two says, show up, shut up. It's literally that simple. Let your client tell you what's up. Let them tell you their problem. Most of them will sell themselves, but MSPs are so focused on being technical, chat, chat, yap, 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 that they forget that their client actually has real business needs. So let that happen. Let them tell you their pain and always sell to that pain you solve. It's really key. So if you don't have discovery questions, we actually have a full discovery question list. Um, I know we're going to, everybody that came to this today, we're going to send some follow-up stuff to you. We have an ultimate discovery question guide that we're going to send you guys out as well. Um, but asking those discovery questions is really, really key. And you heard me mention selling to the pain you solve, find those pain points during your, not only in from, you know, actually the technical discovery is great, but what's way more important when decision maker says, yeah, uh, we're having all these problems. That's way more important because you can highlight those and sell to those, right? And make sure you sell, you run your full assessment. Again, not just a technical discovery. That stuff's great. But for the most part on your, especially on your existing clients, you already got, and your clients already know what they have too. And how much stuff do we really find that's valuable to the client? That risk side? Oh my God, that's so valuable to the client because for the most part, they don't even know. Like Paul, how many times did you find, you've done this a bunch. How many times did you find where the client is like, oh my God, that's what I have? Oh no, nobody. <laughs> they don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. And and even and you're talking about stuff like we've done engineering firms, we've done construction companies. Even those, it's not like the CPAs and the law firms and stuff like that, like who have sensitive data. Um, so it is definitely a big part of the process. Yeah, just yep. finding that stuff. Yep. So as you go, then make sure that you actually have a scheduled meeting. Review your assessment reports walk into your prospect or, or if you're doing it virtually, that's fine too. We are doing, I think Paul's doing almost all his stuff virtually now. Um, but review those assessment reports and findings and build the solution. This is what we were talking about earlier. Build a solution to their problems, make it all encompassing. If you're line item pricing, all of your stuff, all you're doing is commoditizing yourself. 
And that's, that's very traditional and very still out there. So, so we got, we got about five, four minutes mm -hmm. left to, yep, I got one yep. slide after this. So we're good. Fantastic. And somebody asked, asked um, if they get this presentation, yes, you guys can have this slide deck for sure. I think yeah, Lisa uh, already, Sean, Lisa already addressed it. We are, we already got, got you guys covered. Yes. So here's a couple really quick tips. Number one, make sure I actually, I'm going to do a, a pre one, make sure that you have a multi-step sales process, not just a single meeting, how many MSPs go in and have a single meeting and then just drop everything and price it on the fly. It's per, it's important that you have multiple steps. Number real one, always book the next meeting before learning, leaving the current meeting. This is really, really important. Get something on the books, make them commit. That's a purchase in their head. That is a mini buy that they're doing. Also never list out prices and earlier. Follow the all you can eat model or the all you, all in solution price model. Again, if you have guys have questions about this, feel free to ask. We can talk about this separately. Um, and also never skip the steps, never skip the discovery and assessment phases of your sales process, but also be very ready for objections. You're going to get them, you know, especially if you're kind of an amateur at this or not doing it a lot. A lot of times when you get pricing objections and other objections, what it means is you didn't eliminate them in the pre-sales phase. So you have an opportunity to eliminate a lot of variables and a lot of questions early, but if you get them at the place, you're more than likely skipping steps in your sales process. So be ready for your price is high. I'm not ready to commit, et cetera, et cetera. But you just imagine if you walk into a room and you haven't established a budget with a client in your initial discovery and they give you, oh, your price is way too high. You should know a little bit of this ahead of time. You should also know that the decision makers are the ones that should be in the room. Like if you're See, getting, look you see what Ray Garcini just said? That was our biggest fight when I came to OIT. I always schedule every next call before I finish my call. I, like that. I, I, like that. I structure my, my time is spent for that hour. If I have an hour long meeting, the last eight minutes is all about what we're doing next. Yeah. Not, not, I don't, I don't let it run to the top of the hour. It is, we got to get it scheduled and also homework, homework for both of us. You have to do this because if I don't have the answers going back to your budget, if you're trying to figure out what your budget is, they're going to say, well, I don't even know what I'm trying to fix. And you're going to say, well, I'm going to work on that part. You guys are working on your part and you're handing out homework. Let, let me say something about budget before we end, because I do think this is a key difference of, of how Chris has benefited me um, specifically. And we were able to land a, a pretty big deal because of this. Um, but we went to a, an existing client, went through that whole process. They already had their budget in place. Um, but we were able to call Chris, bounce some ideas, and we came up with a really good solution for both of us. And we were able to secure like a six hundred thousand dollar contract over a five year term, um, with some interesting ways we structured it. Uh, but having someone to bounce that off of is a huge benefit of the process. It, it was an immediate like instead of just taking their objection as what they said, I had an advocate that oh you know what let me get back with you on that. Call Chris. We had a meeting about it. Figured out how to approach it and came back with a solution that worked for them. And we were able to sign them for quite a, a large contract. Yeah. And Sean, the, the kind of last thing I'll leave with, and I know you only got one minute left, but sell, sell, get out there, get, get in front of people. Stop worrying about, we got a guy that, uh, that works with us. That's in Australia. He is absolutely obsessed with making sure that his stack is perfect. And what's interesting is he's been obsessed with this stuff for like six weeks now. Well, in the time that he's been obsessed with the stack being perfect, the stacks changed twice. Like it's right. had to because the market has changed already. So stop being obsessed with the technical crap. It's great. It's always going to be there. You can figure it out after they are onboarding when you're onboarding them, get them yep. sold first, focus on sales. So awesome. Um, yeah. We will be getting this deck out to everybody. So let me, yeah. Hey, first off everybody top right corner says seven figures MSP. You can click right on there. It takes them right to the booth. I suggest you do so. If you want to get that deck. Um, other than that, Chris, Paul, thank you guys. This was great. Uh, you talk we should, today, man. I love it, right? <laughs> we should do this more often, man. Yeah, we uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see you in about, oh, speaking of which, this evening, actually, not for me this evening, 6.30 is a happy hour. That's also sponsored by these guys. So please make sure you make it because Lisa's excited to see everybody. She even I'll got her hair done. She dyed her hair for everybody purple. So <laughs> I did too. Yeah, mine's, mine's <laughs> not. <laughs> John did uh, also, so. I did. It's good. I got tips <laughs> there. Back to the eighties. Okay. Uh, thanks thanks guys. guys. Everybody take it easy. Appreciate see you it. soon. All right. We'll see you. Thank you. All right. Good job guys. Uh, streams ended. So. Awesome.
Nice. Yeah, that was good. We did. It was a good wing session. It was good. It, we've had great interaction with people. That's the thing. And yeah, honestly, there was some really good chat there. Uh, I'm surprised at how good that chat was. So. Yeah, you guys for over 50 most of the time too. There was yeah, like good. heavy chat going on. So I would jump over to your booth to see if anyone pops over. But I'm gonna run Lisa's out. there. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, at least I'll be um, there. We have our coaching call, so I got to run to that. So that starts started a minute ago. So I got to run. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate um, it. We'll be doing more. We're sponsored with you now too. So we'll yeah, get a same. bunch of shit set up. All right. Thanks, thanks man. Good thanks, seeing you. Paul. Appreciate your time, sir. No problem. Pleasure. Bye. There you guys.